Welcome to our Sunday podcast. Today, our second podcast, as we address our readings of the of the Book of Mormon. Um, just to remind you uh, from our last podcast, uh, we'll be doing two weeks worth of material with each podcast. So we'll be presenting twice a month. Uh, today we'll be covering materials that are found in your week three and week four readings of Come Follow Me in the Book of Mormon. That would be 1 Nephi chapters 6 through 15. And again, as we mentioned last time we met, we certainly want to answer the questions that you might have. So at the conclusion of podcasts, we'll address those questions that are sent in to us and want to make sure that you, uh, you get the answers that you're looking for. So uh, just by way of reminder, again, t- we're going to use as the theme for our podcast, uh, for our uh, Book of Mormon studies, the phrase to convince all people that Jesus is the Christ, which is the purpose and intent of the Book of Mormon. Today we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time and examine Lehi and Nephi's visions of the Tree of Life. Uh, I've included a document, as you'll see, that will follow through on a number of slides that compares both visions. So let's take a look now at some similarities and some comparisons of, of these visions the two men had. In Lehi's vision, he sees a dark and dreary wilderness or a wasteland. In 1 Nephi chapter 8, verses 4 and 7, it says, For behold, methought I saw in my dream a dark and dreary wilderness. I beheld myself that I was in a dark and dreary waste. Well, Ezra Taft Benson uh, describes this dark and dreary wasteland as the temptations of the world. Now, in 1 Nephi chapter 8, verse 9, it says, again, this is Lehi, I beheld a large and spacious field. Well, the large and spacious field is representative of the world, the world. In 1 Nephi chapter 8, verse 10, And it came to pass that I beheld a tree whose fruit was desirable to make one happy. Nephi's vision now picks up at this particular point with the tree of life. The tree of life is representative of the love of God, which is most sweet, white, joyous, and desirable. Lehi's vision goes on to to describe the fruit of the tree. In 1 Nephi chapter 8 verse 12 it says, And as I partook of the fruit thereof, It filled my soul with exceedingly great joy, for I knew that it was desirable above all other fruit. Elder Holland tells us that the fruit of the tree is nothing more than the atonement of Jesus Christ, the greatest of all the gifts of God. Now, Lehi and Nephi both see a river or fountain of filthy water. In 1 Nephi 8.13, Lehi says, I beheld a river of water, and it ran around along, and it was near the tree of which I was partaking of the fruit. And in Nephi's vision, in 1 Nephi 12, 16, it says, and again, Nephi is told by the angel, Behold, the fountain of filthy water which thy father saw, yea, even the river of which he spoke, and the depths thereof are the depths of hell. So again, we're getting further definition to some of these uh, events that are seen in these visions. Nephi also saw the justice of God, which divides the wicked from the righteous. And this has kind of been likened to Adam and Eve when they were separated from the tree of life by a cherubim, by, by, by brightness or glory or fire. In 1 Nephi 15, 30, it says, And I said unto them that are our father also, and I said unto them that our father also saw that the justice of God did also divide the wicked from the righteous, and, and the brightness thereof was likened to the brightness of a flaming fire, which is set up to God forever and ever, and hath no end. So again, this concept of, of division here. Um, Nephi also saw a fountain of living water. Uh, Again, not to be confused with the fountain of filthy water that was seen earlier. In 1 Nephi chapter 11, verse 25, it says, 
the word of God, which led to the fountain of living water, which waters are a representation of the love of God. So this particular fountain is the love of God, whether, whether, whether as the, the, the filthy fountain or river is the depths of hell. Now both Lehi and Nephi saw the rod of iron, which if hearkened unto and held fast, one would never perish. In 1 Nephi chapter 11, verse 25, it says, And it came to pass that I beheld that the rod of iron which my father had seen was the word of God. Now, Lehi's vision, in it he also saw a straight and narrow path. And that's 1 Nephi 8, 20, and it says, And I also beheld a straight and narrow path which came along by the rod of iron, even to the tree by which I stood. Well, both Nephi and Lehi saw the mist of darkness, which represented the temptations of Satan. Nephi expounded that these things included such things as apostasy and war, the great and abominable church, the plain and precious things that were removed from the scriptures, in 1st Nephi chapter 12 verse 17 it says and the mists of darkness are the temptations of the devil which blindeth the eyes and hardens the hearts of the children of men and lead them away into broad roads that they perish and are lost now both Lehi and Nephi saw in their vision a great and spacious building this building represents the pride and vain imaginations of the world. It also represents those who would persecute the Son of God and his followers. In 1 Nephi chapter 11, verse 36, it says, And it came to pass that I saw and bear record that the great and spacious building was the pride of the world, and it fell, and the fall thereof was exceedingly great. And finally, both men saw the, the forbidden paths and strange roads that men would follow. Ezra Taft Benson said these paths lead to such things as drug abuse, pornography, and immorality. In 1 Nephi 8, 28, it says, And after they had tasted of the fruit, they were ashamed because of those who were scoffing at them. And they fell away, fell away into forbidden paths and were lost. In an article that I recently read by Charles Swift, who is a uh, professor of religion at BYU, um, he, he, he said that some elements of Lehi's vision, such as the tree of life, the fruit, the river of water, the rod of iron, different groups of different people, and the great and spacious building can actually be seen in Nephi's vision of the Lord's mortal ministry and the apostasy that would follow. For example, the first group of people in Lehi's dream, those who made some progress and then lose their way, may correspond to the Nephites who were destroyed for their wickedness before the Savior visited their civilization. The second group those who held fast to the rod partook of the fruit, but then fell away because of the mocking of the people in the great and spacious building may represent the Nephites who survive the midst of darkness and destruction at the Savior's crucifixion and partook of the spiritual fruits when the Savior ministered to them. But their descendants eventually fell away because of pride. The third group of people in Lehi's dream who were divided between the righteous who partook of the fruit and remained faithful and the wicked who felt their way along towards the building, some of them drowning in the depths of the fountain or became lost on forbidden paths may relate to Nephi's vision of the division in the last days between the two churches, the church of the Lamb of God and the church of the devil. There's one more future historic event that is alluded to in Nephi's vision. Uh, as he sees the end of the world, Nephi sees that John the Revelator is told that he'll be the one 
to write these things. In 1 Nephi 14, 21 and 22, it says, John shall see and write the remainder of these things, yea, and also many things which have been, and he shall also write concerning the end of the world. Well, it's quite probable that the man that Nephi saw dressed in white robes that escorted him through this vision was none other than John the Revelator. It's apparent that Nephi's vision picks up pretty much where Le Lehi's vision concluded. Nephi not only saw all that his father saw, but his vision included such things as the colonization of America, the coming forth of the Bible, the loss of many plain and precious things that were taken from the Bible, the apostasy of the Gentiles, the coming forth of Latter-day Scripture, and the building up of Zion. So Nephi had this great glorious vision that went far beyond the tree of life. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland has written, At the very onset of the Book of Mormon, in its first fully developed allegory, Christ is portrayed as the source of truth and the living evidence of divine love. I now want to take some time and focus our attention perhaps on the most significant element of both Lehi and Nephi's vision, and that's the tree of life. The tree of life's meanings vary from culture to culture. However, a common theme they all share is the idea that the tree connects physical and spiritual worlds. It is fitting that the symbol for life is a tree. And it is apparent that our ancestors clearly understood how important trees were for supporting life on earth, even though they did not have the scientific evidence to support it. The Vikings, the Egyptians, the Celts, Native Americans, and Jewish people all told stories of trees of life. Basically, the tree of life helps to explain the divine plan of why we are here on earth, and what it's going to take to return to our Father in heaven. I'd like to go through some of these cultural tree of lives with you. I have a number of them, um, and you'll find, I think, the common elements between them. The Viking tree of life is sometimes referred to as the Egdrasel tree. Egdrasel tree. This massive tree grew out of the well of Erd. This well of Erd is this endless pool that held universal <clears throat> wisdom. The roots and branches held the nine worlds of the cosmos together. In fact, the well-being of the entire world was dependent on this particular tree's vitality. This tree had two mystic birds that, that lodged in it. It had an eagle, which possessed the knowledge and wisdom, and a hawk, which spread the information through messages to the world. Now the Celtic tree of life, you see here, was very sacred. They believed their ancestors actually became trees once they passed away. The trees undergo seasonal cycles, which they believe were the cycles of life and death. The Celtic tree of life connected the underworld through its roots. The trunk represented the physical world and its high branches reached to the heavens. This was the connection between the world of humans and the world of the gods. The Egyptian tree of life is connected to the story of the god Osiris. Osiris became the first ruler of the world. Osiris had a wicked brother named Set. Set shut him up one day in a coffin and then threw the coffin into the Nile River. The coffin was eventually lodged in a giant sycamore tree. The tree grew up around the coffin, and the tree was then eventually cut down and made into a pillar for a palace. Isis, who is Osiris' wife, eventually found the pillar and returned it to Egypt and planted it in the ground. Osiris then became the god of agriculture and rebirth. The Egyptian tree of life is representative of the cycles of life. The African tree of life is referred to as the baobab tree. These are baobab trees that you see on this slide. These massive trees predate human beings. The baobab tree looks inverted. It looks as if God changed his mind one day and turned the tree upside down and then replanted it in the earth. 
African trees, the baobab trees, have mystical properties, it is felt. They would help prevent one from becoming sick or being harmed. Now, the Greek tree of life is very similar to some of the other ones we've talked about in that its roots reach the underworld and its branches reach the stars. The Kabbalah tree of life. Uh, Kabbalah is an ancient form of Jewish mysticism. It came in the 12th and 13th centuries in southern Spain and France. Followers of Kabbalah believe that we all have a direct union with God. The Kabbalah tree of life is a symbol that contains 10 channels of divine energy. These life forces take place both outside and inside the body. The Kabbalah tree of life diagram shows these geometric shapes and patterns that repeat itself in nature. In other words, they are signs that, the, that a divine power actually created the earth and all life on it. This particular tree of life is really more of a symbol, a diagram, or a map that shows one how to gain universal knowledge, the Kabbalah tree of life. The Asian tree of life, or Babylonian tree of life, is the embodiment of a mother goddess who reigned over all living things. They associate her with a great tree. Their tree of life is tied very closely to the epic story of Gilgamesh, which we discussed in the, our Old Testament podcast. The Mayan tree of life is a massive pentandra tree. The Mayans believed that God planted four or five of these trees at the four corners of the world to hold up the heaven, and then a fifth tree was planted in the center. The roots of this tree connected to the underworld and its branches to the heavens. The middle tree, or the world tree, was especially sacred to them because it was how the gods traveled to the middle world. And we have our Native American tree of life. They worshipped a great cedar tree that connected the heavens and the underworld, just as some of the others that we've talked about. They used the redwood, the great cedar tree. The Chinese tree of life connected three rounds, as they called them, heaven, earth, and the underworld. Well, like the Native American stories, the Chinese world tree, or tree of life, served as a bridge that gods and shamans use to travel between our world and the heavens. In Buddhism, the tree of knowledge is the Buddhai tree, or Bodhai tree. It's pronounced a couple of different ways. According to the Buddhist teachings, Buddha achieved spiritual enlightenment while sitting under a, a Bodhai tree. The Hindu tree of life grows literally upside down, the banyan tree, as you see in the slide. With its roots connecting to the heavens, its branches reaching the earth and bringing blessings to people. The Baha'i faith believe that complete devotion to God is described as a tree of life, or our world's dream. In essence, the tree represents our soul. In the Quran, the tree of life is referred to as the tree of immortality. Allah tells Adam and Eve that they should not eat the fruit from the tree of immort immortality. They make the mistake, however, and they eat from the tree. They must now live and learn to repent from their mistakes. Allah assures them that they will be guided. The tree of immortality represents repenting and learning and growing in God's mercy. In the Bible, the tree of knowledge is similar to the world tree or tree of life. It is the source of universal wisdom. It is interesting that in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve are not supposed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Whereas in Lehi's vision, he and his family are encouraged to partake of the fruit of the tree of life. In the book of Revelation, 
which we discussed a few weeks ago as we concluded our study of the New Testament, John sees two trees of life. Revelations 22, verses 2 and 14 say, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bears twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Well, now that we've completely and thoroughly exhausted uh, the concept of the tree of life, let's turn our attention to the second half of our reading assignment, which was chapters 11 through 15. I'd like to focus our attention on three particular verses, and then I want to kind of expand that just a bit. In 1 Nephi chapter 13, verses 28, 29, and 39 says, Wherefore thou seest that after the book hath gone forth through the hands of the great and abominable church, that there are certain plain and precious things taken away from the book, which is the book of the Lamb of God. After these plain and precious things were taken away, it goeth up forth unto the nations of the Gentiles. And after it goeth forth unto all the nations of the Gentiles, yea, even across the many waters which they have seen with the Gentiles, which have gone forth out of captivity, thou seest, be, thou seest because of the many plain and precious things which have been taken out of the book, which were plain unto the understanding of the children of men, according to the plainness which is in the Lamb of God, because of these things which are taken out of the gospel of the Lamb, an exceedingly great many do stumble, yea, insomuch that Satan hath great power over them. And after it had gone forth unto them, I beheld other books, which came forth by the power of the Lamb, from the Gentiles unto them, unto the convincing of the Gentiles, and the remnant of the seed of my brethren, and also the Jews, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, that the records of the prophets and of the twelve apostles of the Lamb are true. These are three really interesting scriptures. These scriptures talk about lost scripture. Uh, they talk about found scripture, and they talk about new scripture coming forth. I want to address the scripture in general, our scriptures in general, not so much the Book of Mormon, but the ones being alluded to that have been lost, taken from the plain and precious things. I want to talk about three questions. First of all, did the Council of Nicaea select the books of the Bible? Are they the one that, that put together the canon of Scripture we have today? Second, how were the books of the Bible chosen? And thirdly, how did our King James Version of the Bible come to pass? So with that in mind, let us first talk about the Council of Nicaea. This was a gathering of church leaders that actually took place in the year 325 A.D., and it took place about 80 miles south of what today is Istanbul, Turkey. The Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with any part of the assembling of the books of the Bible. Those men that came in the 4th century to the council traveled there to discuss what the 1st century apostles had been teaching about Jesus Christ. Over a period of three months, this group composed a creed or a statement that addressed about 20 different issues, one of which was whether Jesus was actually divine or not. And the answer to that question, of course, is yes. And they concluded that to be the case. There is no evidence to support the idea that the council addressed the issue of what text should actually be in the Bible. None of those assembled ever ever said anything or ever mentioned anything about being involved to help assemble the Bible. So why then are so many people convinced that the Council of Nicaea had something to do with what books ended up in the Bible? I kind of like this slide. I like this young man. He looks like he's full of laughter. 
And that's a good thing because according to an anonymous document that surfaced in the 9th century AD, church leaders at the Council of Nicaea piled all the books that were being considered for inclusion into the Bible. They put them all out onto a table and then they prayed. And as they prayed, all the texts that were not supposed to be assembled into the canon of Scripture suddenly and magically crashed to the floor. The books that remained on the table were then used to form the Bible. I kind of like the laughter here. This is kind of a joke. However, in 2005, Dan Brown further promoted the Council of Nicaea concept as the origin of the Bible in his novel, The Da Vinci Code. And so a medieval myth snaked its way into modern thinking, courtesy of a handful of conspiracy theorists and a best-selling novel. So it brings up our second question. How are the books of the Bible chosen then? Well, the 39 books that you see here constitute the Old Testament from the Bible of Judaism. The Christian Bible includes those 39 books and an additional 27 books of the New Testament as seen on this slide. This is the canon of Scripture that is regarded as inspired of God. So, again, how did we put this all together? Well, the Old Testament contains five books, sometimes called the Torah or Pentateuch. These five books were the first to be accepted as a canon or a body of Scripture. It was probably during the 5th century B.C. that these books were actually assembled. The rest of the Old Testament, the writings of the prophets as we know them, were not brought together into a single form until about 200 B.C. The Old Testament as we know it today was probably actually not fixed or or come together as we know it till just before the coming or, or the birth of Christ. Now the assembly of the New Testament was decided in the first and second century AD. At this time there were many writings that were circulating among the Christians. Heretical movements were rising and each were selecting scriptures and documents that they felt were important. Such scriptures may have included books such as the Gospel of Thomas, perhaps the Shepherd of Hermas, the Apocalypse of Peter, or the Epistle of Barnabas. It was actually not until 367 AD that the church father Athanasius, Athanasius first provided a complete listing of 66 books that ought to be considered to be in our Bible. Three different criteria, criteria were used by the early church leaders in assembling the book. First, the book, was it written by an apostle or someone close to them? Second, was the text old? And thirdly, did the text conform with current Christian teachings and ideas? You know, not all Christian Churches today consider the books of the Bible to be their canon of Scripture. For example, most Protestant Bibles have 66 books. However, the Roman Catholic Bible has 73, including seven that are known as the Apocrypha. Now, the word Apocrypha comes from the Greeks, and it means hidden or secret books. I have personally many such texts in my library. Some of them include the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher, the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Revelation of the Magi, the Gospel of Judas, the Acts of John, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Acts of Peter, and the Infancy Gospels of James and Thomas, just to name a few. I have many others. You just have to uh, read through some of this and you have to find those, those special little gems, uh, those gems of truth that are there. So the question now is asked, how did we get our King James Version of the Bible? Well, our King James Version of the Bible was the English Bible. On March 24th, 1603, King James inherited the throne of England. 
A year later, in 1604, a conference of churchmen requested that, an, that their English Bible that they had be revised because they said, quote, existing translations were corrupt and not answerable to the truth of the original. By June of 18, by, by June 30th of 1604, King James had approved a list of 54 scholars that would be responsible and participate in the revision of the English Bible. They were organized into six groups working separately at Westminster, Oxford, and Cambridge. Richard Bancroft, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, served as the overseer, and he established a set of rules to ensure the translation was nonpartisan in nature. The translators used a partial translation of William Tyndale to go from, as, as well as Jewish commentaries to help them guide their work. The translators used the original Hebrew scripture in making a conscious effort to be accurate in all they were doing as far as translation was concerned. This new Bible was then published in 1611. And I might mention in 1982, a completely new King James Version, and it's referred to as the NKJV Version of the Bible, was published. Again, that was 1982. They updated and modernized some of the wording. Well, the bottom line is simply what we find in our eighth article of faith. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today. I hope our discussion of the Tree of Life and the origin of the Bible has been perhaps of interest to you. I'll see you next time when we will be discussing material that will be found in weeks 5 and 6 of your Come Follow Me manual, and that will include the scriptures found in 1 Nephi chapters 16 through 22, We'll complete 1 Nephi, and then the first two chapters of 2 Nephi. Again, thank you for joining me, and don't forget to send in any questions that you might have at the conclusion of our podcast. We'll certainly address those and make sure that we, uh, we get them appropriately answered. Thanks again for joining me. Mm-hmm.